Uh, this talk is about how to use Jupyter at NERSC. Um, I'm Rollin, I'm in the Data and Analytics Services Group and I take care of Jupyter at NERSC. Okay, I did that. Okay, what is Jupyter? Um, Jupyter, of course, is an interactive open source web application that lets you create and share these documents that are called notebooks. Um, it's been around a while. I think a lot of people use it for all kinds of stuff because you can put all kinds of neat things in notebooks, live code, equations, visualizations, narrative text, even these cool interactive widget thingies. Um, people use Jupyter notebooks for all kinds of things, cleaning up their data, um, transforming data, actually running simulations, modeling, making statistical models. Um, Jupyter is really a platform for all kinds of other things you might want to do, like data analytics, machine learning, deep learning. It's really a, a great platform for that kind of stuff. And also for managing workflows and scalable analytics frameworks. Um, why do we care about NERSC? Uh, why do we care about Jupyter at NERSC? Um, there are a lot of users, obviously, that use Jupyter at NERSC, but there are also a lot of experiments that have made Jupyter part of their data analysis framework. So some of them are listed here. Some of you may even be members of some of those collaborations and experiments. Um, I don't doubt that there are a lot of people who are new to NERSC but are really not new to Jupyter at all. Some of the people on this call may actually have taken data eight at UC Berkeley and may be in this picture of all of the students in Cellar Rock Hall. That class is completely taught on Jupyter Notebooks, so people come out of that class expecting to be able to do data science anywhere using a Jupyter Notebook. And so those users come to NERSC, and so uh, we, not, we have to be able to help them. Um, and also, new, Jupyter Notebooks have become this uh, new tool for aiding in reproducibility and science outreach. Uh, so there's an example here on the left-hand side of the screen of a uh, Jupyter Notebook that you can download and you can reproduce this binary black hole merger uh, plot. Um, we've been running, uh, supporting Jupyter at NERSC for uh, about five, six years. Um, this is the timeline. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but Jupyter has been running on Cori basically uh, from the first year that Cori had been deployed. Um, the resources that are set aside on Cori for running Jupyter, right now there are three nodes that uh, can run Jupyter notebooks that are not batch, uh, batch scheduled. Um, batch scheduled Jupyter is possible running Jupyter on the Cori GPU nodes, if you have access to that, that's possible too. We'll be adding another node. So there will be four nodes um, after the next maintenance for running um, shared note for running notebooks. Um, and this is a plot of how many Jupyter users there are per month. So the first thing you'll notice is that there's quite a lot of them and the new record for the number of users per month is beating last month and this month isn't even over yet. Um, so really, it's a very popular service. You could compare this to the number of users who log in across all of the Cori login nodes, all 12 of them in a month. That's about 2,900 users. So there are a lot of Jupyter users. If you're a Jupyter user, you're a very good company at NERSC. Okay, how do you do it at NERSC? Jupyter um, is provided through a Jupyter Hub deployment. The Hub is a thing which authenticates you and starts up your notebook for you. Okay, this is a lot better than starting up a Jupyter notebook in an SSH tunnel and then trying to connect to it. We saw users doing that. We thought that was really painful. So we set up a hub for our users. Okay, um, the way you do it, there's three steps. It's very easy. You authenticate at jupyter.nurse.gov. You need to use your one-time password. It's a multi-factor authentication um, supporting service. Then you choose where you want your notebook to start up, and there are usually two or three choices. Most users are just gonna see the two buttons here, the Cori button and the spin button. These are labeled shared CPU nodes. That means that the node is shared between you and maybe 50 other users. Okay, so it's a lot like a regular login node that you heard about this morning that you SSH into, and you can do stuff like compile or look at your data or whatever. Um, you have to be mindful that there are other people on there. So you can't do something like take all of the memory and not let anybody else do anything. Um, that isn't nice and we don't allow that. So um, be mindful of the fact that you might be sharing with, with quite a few other people. 
Um, there are other buttons that show up here depending on what kind of permissions you've got. If you have access to uh, the Cori GPU cluster, then you, you would see a button here um, that would allow you to start a notebook on the GPU cluster. So first step, authenticate, then you choose, and then you just go. You click one of these buttons and your notebook should hopefully spin up. Okay, how do you make that decision? So as I mentioned before, the shared, the shared nodes are on the left-hand side here. There are these three nodes set up for Cori. What can you do with that? You can see all of the file systems. So you can see community file system, your home uh, directory, you can see Cori Scratch. Uh, so you can interact with any data that's in any of those file systems. Um, it's the same exact Python environment as if you um, logged in via SSH, which is a big plus. So there's no difference between how you interact with Python through Jupyter um, and how you interact with Python over SSH. And you can submit jobs and you can interact with the batch queues. Um, we've created this kind of slur magic that some people like, but other people don't like it and they just use shell magics. It's fine, whatever. Um, the spin shared CPU node is really kind of a backup option if Cori is down for some reason, like we're having a maintenance, but the spin node is up. Um, it's external to Cori. It cannot see Cori Scratch, and you cannot run jobs from it. But you can see the community file system. You can see your home directory and all of that. So if you have data there and you need to make a plot because your paper deadline is tomorrow, you can use the spin shared CPU node option. And as I mentioned, the GPU node, um, if you click that button, if you can see it, not everybody can see it, it launches a notebook for you. It runs in batch, but it doesn't get charged. But you can only run for up to four hours. It'll turn off. OK? All right. Um, on the hub, we have a couple of additional services that you might want to know about um, that are going to be rolled out here within the next month. Um, the hub allows us to run these kind of user-facing services or management services. And we use them to provide a, another route for providing users Jupyter-specific information about the status of the service. So if there's going to be an upcoming maintenance for, um, for, oh, <laughs> for Jupyter, um, you might see a, a banner on um, all the hub pages saying when it's going to be. Um, so this is not supposed to replace the nurse message of the day. Usually there's a link from that message to the nurse message of the day. Um, because those maintenances are coordinated uh, through that. But this might be um, something that you see and, it, and hopefully it will be useful to you. Um, in addition, there's another service that we've just started experimenting with called NB Viewer, which is a way to render a notebook as static HTML, which in itself is kind of neat, but not as useful as this other feature, which is the ability to copy a notebook from somewhere else on the web or from another user even and um, start that up in your own home directory using your notebook server. So this is a way where you could say, pick up a CAN notebook that somebody else has already written and copy it over along with its kernel and then start it up and, um, and customize it uh, to do whatever you need to do with it. So if you log into jupyter.nurse.gov today, you won't see this little drop down here with these two service links, but after we do the upgrade, which is gonna be coming in the next month, you'll see those services um, there. Um, once you're in, um, the default way of running a Jupyter notebook at NERSC is through Jupyter Lab, and it has been um, basically since it was in beta, I think. Um, it's got a file browser, it's got your notebooks over here in tabs, you can start terminals and all other kinds of widgets and cool stuff. Um, a couple of goodies um, that we've developed and deployed for all the users are, I'm going to call them out here. One of them is called um, Jupyter Lab Favorites. One of the things that happened when we first deployed Jupyter Lab was we observed that it was really easy for users to get lost on the file system if they're just clicking over here on the, um, on the file browser. It's really easy to get lost and not be able to find your way back to your home directory. Plus, it's kind of tedious to click around a, a massive parallel file system trying to find you know, your scratch directory or whatever. So um, we decided to make that easier by making kind of bookmarks. And so this is an extension to Jupyter Lab. It's not part of Jupyter Lab. If you install your own Jupyter Lab on your laptop, you're not going to see it. Um, but we 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 precede it with um, these two directories because most users need access to those. Um, so play with that. It's pretty neat. It'll save a lot of time and clicking. Um, a couple other things is this open from path thing. We we made it so that you could hop to any place on the file system that's handy in tandem with the favorites uh, tool. 
And also recents, a list of uh, recently accessed files and paths is, is located in the file, file menu as well. All right, so if you use Jupyter, you're, you might be aware that the way that you actually run code is through a thing called a kernel. So here's you, you're happy. Here's your browser, and then over here is the notebook server. So for instance, in our case, I would be running on Cori. I'm Cori 19 or Cori 13 or something. And there's another process that you spin up. Basically, every tab that you start up is another process, and that's called a kernel in Jupyter parlance. And you talk to it through zero and Q. All right, so how you configure this kernel basically tells you what you can do in a Jupyter notebook. It's basically just a Python process or a Julia process or an R process or something that you send commands to and it sends the output back. All right, the number one question we get about um, Jupyter at NERSC for the most part is how do I take a Conda environment? So what uh, one of the things that uh, Lori just talked about in the previous talk was Conda environments. How do I take my Conda environment that I've made and just use that from Jupyter? So there's a few different ways to accomplish that. The one that I like the best is shown here. So you create your content environment, you put it whatever it is you need it, and then you add this additional package called ipykernel, okay? Once that's all installed, then you run this command here, and that will create a kernel spec, which is a special JSON file that gets dropped in a kind of secret place in your home directory. And your content environment will show up basically in the list of kernels that are available on jupyter.nurse.gov. You'll probably need to restart your notebook server if you do this while your notebook server is running. This is what one of the kernel spec files looked like. I said it was in like a kind of secret place. It's not that secret. It's your home directory dot local share Jupyter kernels. And then the name of the kernel that you gave it at that IPy kernel um, install line and then kernel.json, it's always in that. And all it is is really just what command line arguments do you need to start up IPy IPython, basically. Okay, so this is just a template for how you do that. Now, um, why do you need to know this? Because you probably want to customize it further. If you have other executables that you want to be able to run while you're running your kernel, you need to put those in a path. Or if there's uh, some dynamically linked application that you need to include, you need to extend the LD library path. You can do that through this env part of the kernel spec. Um, but in in actuality, I don't really like this way of customizing a Jupyter um, kernel at NERSC uh, because this kind of obliterates whatever path you had before and it completely overwrites the LD library path and that's kind of inconvenient. A better option is for you to just say, hey, I'm going to, um, instead of running Python, which is what this first argv argument is, I'm gonna run some other bash script. And you can put whatever you want in there, but the very last thing needs to be exact Python dash M IPy kernel. So that's basically whatever you were running before, right? So Python dash M IPy kernel, F connection file, whatever. It's basically the same stuff gets passed in here. And what this lets you do is you can load whatever other module you want to load. A lot of people, this is a common one because people like to make LaTeX labels on matplotlib plots, I don't know, go figure. Um, or you could set some environment variable or whatever. I think this is really the most flexible approach um, because of the module thing and, and because of uh, environment variables. But really, don't forget this exec part. The exec part is very important. All right. Another cool thing you can do is you can actually put a, a, a Python environment inside of a, um, inside of a Docker container and run that as a kernel. And um, I think Shifter is gonna be covered later, um, but this is how you would take one of those Docker containers and run it as a, as a Python kernel. So if you have a Docker container where you have all of your stuff already set up and you don't wanna mess around with a con environment for whatever reason at NERSC, then cool. This is really handy if you've got like a collaboration and everybody agrees they're gonna use this Docker container for all their Python stuff, say but it's really basically just whatever command it is you would run on the command line, you stick it in there, All right? Um, what do you do when things go bad with Jupyter? Sometimes problems happen. Um, I would say the number one problem we get with, with Jupyter users is they fill their home directory up and then they can't run Jupyter. And what will happen is you'll see that your notebook fails to start up and you'll get like a little message 507, which in 
HTTP means you're out of space. Um, and you just need to go back and move some data out of your home directory and then you can run Jupyter again. Um, we might make a couple of changes in the future that will allow your Jupyter notebook to keep running, but if it were me, I would wanna actually know that my home directory was full. Um, but that's probably the thing that people are most likely to run into. Next one will be their environment is kind of messed up, like Lori was talking about. Their bash RC maybe has lots of Python path stuff that kind of confuse Jupyter Lab about what uh, what function calls it's making, basically, in its search path, its library search path. That's a kind of clear one that happened. So those are kind of, and th disentangling those it can be kind of messy. But the way to figure out what's going on, especially with the second one, is that you look at this awesome log file called dot jupyter dot log everybody that runs jupyter at nurse gets one of these in their home directory and you know nobody else can look at it unless you like change the permissions we force the permissions to be kind of um so that only you can read it really um but basically this tells you what's going on with your jupyter notebook while it's running so there's all kinds of stuff that comes out and if there's a problem usually you'll see some kind of traceback that kind of tells you where the answer is like if you mess up your kernel spec and you mess up the JSON inside, you'll see a JSON parsing error or something like that, right? So before you fire off a ticket to me saying, hey, Jupyter is broken, fix it, you should go take a look at the .jupyter.log uh, and see if there's anything you can do about it. It's really your friend. All right, what are we gonna do in the near future with Jupyter at NERSC? Um, I mentioned that we're gonna add another node. so. Um, we'll be able to support more users and we'll be able to uh, do so in a more stable fashion than we have uh, recently. Um, we're working on what the strategy for Jupyter with Perlmutter is going to look like. Um, there will be Jupyter running on Perlmutter in some form or fashion. Um, so that'll be cool because there's all those GPUs there and there's all kinds of deep learning frameworks that come in that you can access from Jupyter Notebooks. So that ought to be a lot of fun. Um, one of the things that I'm focusing on, especially in the next year, is streamlining um, distributed analytics frameworks like Dask or IPy Parallel or Ray or whatever, um, and trying to streamline those on our system. Um, they work great in the cloud, but you've got to do a little bit of adaptation to make them actually work as nicely on HPC systems. So I'm going to try to make that easier. Um, enabling users to control what Jupyter Lab notebook is running is another thing I'm working on. Um, that means that you'll be able to install your own custom extensions. If for some reason you don't like Jupyter Lab recents, you could make it go away, say. Um, and then uh, providing more access to running um, kind of bigger Jupyter jobs, things like Jupyter on compute nodes, um, extending Jupyter Lab to say, have a nice interface to Slurm or something like that. Those are other research projects we're doing. Okay, so that's the Jupyter talk. Um, you know, if you want to use Jupyter, go to jupyter.nurse.gov and figure it out. Kernel spec, refer to these slides if you get lost on how to actually convert a conda environment into a kernel and use it from Jupyter. Um, there's also documentation uh, basically on the website, it's the same thing. And uh, customize away. And if you, get, if you get in trouble, just file a ticket, email me, let me know how it's going and, and I'll help you out. Hey, thanks, Rollin. Um, we have one question. Uh, we have someone who'd like to use Julia in Jupyter. Uh, can you recommend the best way to do that? Yeah, you can do that. <clears throat> um, so what I've done in the past with users who've tried to use um, iJulia is um, just let them install their own Julia stack, which is actually pretty um, straightforward. And a lot of Julia users are used to doing that anyway. There's a pretty decent installer. It gets you a pretty performant Julia, um, uh, Julia already out of the box. And then um, you just follow the instructions for installing the iJulia kernel. And I think, I think that that just kind of works. If there are problems, send me a ticket because I have gotten enough, at least a couple other users using iJulia at NERSC. And so it can be done. People have done it. We did bump into one thing that needed to be fixed in the iJulia kernel, but it was a pretty easy fix. Could someone install Julia in a Conda environment? Um, I don't know of a way of doing that. Okay. Those two things seem to be kind of separate worlds. Julia has its own way of managing packages. 
and I don't know if Conda and Julia are ever going to talk about about that. Okay. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much.